Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to the analysis.news. In a few seconds, we'll be back to discuss a new Netflix series, Hit and Run, which is a co production with Israel. And I'll be speaking to an actor who was offered a part and turned it down because it was a co production with Israel. Don't forget the donate button and the subscribe button and so on. We're you might have noticed where several of our videos that were deleted by YouTube are now back up. Uh, so we're sort of back uh, on YouTube because they were threatening to cancel our channel. But after a Matt Taibbi article called them out on it, uh, they reversed course on two of the three videos. But one, the first video uh, on our reporting on January 6th has still been deleted. So it ain't over between us and YouTube on this issue. But more on that later. We'll be back in a few seconds. Hit and Run, a new Netflix series, is the story of a former Israeli mercenary who now runs a tour guide business. His wife is killed, and that sets him off looking for the killers. The story takes place in Israel and New York. I've only watched a couple of episodes, but so far, one thing that's missing in the Israeli segments are Palestinians. Israel seems to be entirely normal, an entirely normal country, not one that's occupying Palestinian territories and bombing civilians in Gaza. The series is a co-production with an Israeli company that also produced the series Fauda. David Clannon, a veteran American actor, turned down a role in Hit and Run because he considers Israel a racist and apartheid state, and he supports the movement to boycott, divest, and sanction Israel. David Clannon is a very vocal political activist. In 1967, during the most savage years of U.S. aggression against Vietnam, Clennon turned in his Selective Service System Identification Card, which was a federal felony, and joined the draft resistance movement. As his career developed, he, he says he always tried to follow his moral and political convictions. He turned down roles in Just Cause, which promoted the death penalty, television series uh, Fox's show 24, which promoted torture. In 2018, Clinton engaged in a campaign to alert Emmy voters to the half-truths, distortions, omissions in Ken Burns' PBS series, The Vietnam War. And I got to say, I particularly uh, want to talk to him about that because I thought that got so little attention, just how uh, bad that history was. It was nominated for four Emmys, but it received none. Perhaps some of that has to do with Clennon's efforts. He's been arrested for civil disobedience. He's been he's clashed with the Hollywood establishment. The producers of the Israeli TV series Fauda offered Clennon an undisclosed role in season two, but Clennon publicly stated that he rejected the opportunity because of his support for Palestinians. Clennon played Palmer in John Carp Carpenter's The Thing in 1982. He got his first film role in 1973 in The Paper Chase and followed up with Bound for Glory in 1976, Coming Home in 1978, Being There in 79. In his movies, he's worked with Jack Lemmon, Sissy Spacek, Meryl Streep, Susan, Susan Sarandon, amongst many others. He moved into TV drama in The Migrants and several roles in the classic comedy Barney Miller. He's most famous for his role as Miles Dentrell on the acclaimed drama 30-something in 1987. It's quite unusual for an actor as successful as David Clennon to be so outspoken on political issues and to turn down roles out of a political conviction. It's particularly unique to take such a strong position on Israeli apartheid while working in Hollywood where even most liberals shy away from criticizing Israel succumbing to the pressure that criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism. Now joining us is David Clennon. Thanks very much for joining me, David. Thank you, Paul. Good to be here. So, so what, tell us the story, first of all, uh, of what happened with Hit and Run. And later in the interview, we'll talk more about your, your history. Sure. Uh, first, I have to correct you. I was not offered the role of... Martin Wexler in Hit and Run. I was given an opportunity to audition for the role. And when I discovered that it was a 
collaboration between Hollywood companies and uh, more, maybe more than one uh, Israeli companies. Uh, that's when I told my agents that I would not audition for this part. I would not create a video of myself reading the part and submit it to the casting uh, people. How did your agents react to that? They tolerate my decisions and uh, they don't scold me. Um, so I give them a lot of credit for uh, for understanding. And uh, they, they, I believe uh, one of their current clients is also Ed Asner. So uh, Ed is very outspoken and uh, contentious. So uh, maybe, uh, maybe they like clients uh, who are kind of feisty, but uh, they also need to uh, pay the rent. So uh, I appreciate their being understanding in situations like this. And most of the time, uh, I, I don't object to anything in the material. Um, but this was, this was a special occasion. And I felt that I wanted to be a part of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. So I wrote an article about my decision, and I submitted it to truth out and they published it and it created something of a stir and uh, considerable backlash among uh, internet trolls uh, saying some pretty nasty stuff but uh, I thought that it was worthwhile to do that um, because it raised the the issue of boycotting Israel on the cultural front. So, when in in your activism did the issue of BDS and Israel uh, become so important to you? Was there a, a set of events, or was it always part of your politics? Uh I believe that that BDS came into focus for me during the 2014 attack on Gaza, uh, where I joined protests at the Israeli consulate in Los Angeles. There have been so many massacres in Gaza that I, I, I lose track, but I believe that in 2014, there was one that was particularly atrocious. And it was at that point that I became acquainted with Jewish Voice for Peace. And the issue of boycott, divestment, and sanctions began to come into focus for me. Um, and I was I attracted to the idea because I felt that it had been effective in ending apartheid in South Africa. And there was a precedent. The, 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 uh, the organization Artists for a New South Africa gave us, in the present moment, a template, I think, for a BDS movement in Hollywood. And that's, what's been the reaction to your article and not auditioning for the role in Hollywood. I, I, I know you've talked about trolls on the internet, but what about, you know, uh, producers, actors, uh, people that might hire you in the future? I don't think that I'll ever know what their real reactions are or what action they might take. Uh, there was, there was one a uh, very outspoken producer. He was one of the producers on Call Me By Your Name, which was uh, a film that came out two or three years ago, had some Academy Award nominations. I believe it won an award for Best Ad Adapted Screenplay. And this uh, producer uh, wrote a comment on an article in the Jewish Journal, 
which is a, a widely circulated uh, magazine in Los Angeles. And um, he said, uh, I'm going to get my Jewish friends to blacklist this guy or to punish him for what he has done. Um, but that was, that's someone who spoke out impulsively. And I don't think that, that most, it, it, Hollywood is not a transparent city state. It's, there's a lot of opacity here. And most of us who operate on, uh, in the lower circles of Hollywood will never know what uh, transpires uh, in the uh, offices and the boardrooms of the uh, corporate owners and managers. So uh, I can't be sure um, what, uh, what might have happened as a result of publishing that article. It's not hard to speculate, though, given uh, most of the uh, certainly uh, Jewish establishment in Hollywood, but not only Jewish establishment. Uh, there's a very strong pro-Israel, pro-Zionist uh, uh, positioning there. Uh, so you, you had to know that. I mean, you could have just turned down the audition and not written the article, but you really did want to make a point out of all this. And you were willing to accept the consequences. Right. And uh, I did it in the hope that it would encourage other actors and other artists behind the camera artists, as well as actors, uh, that it would encourage them to think about what they're doing when they sell themselves and they sell their talents to companies possibly making projects that don't reflect the values of the artist or uh, being made by companies whose agenda they wouldn't agree with. So I, I, I was hopeful that it would begin a conversation about um, about that issue, and I I think by the way you're uh, you're right to make a distinction between the Jewish community within Hollywood and the world of Hollywood as a whole. Um, some people have said that Hollywood is a Jewish town which is not only inaccurate, in my opinion, it's inaccurate and it's ethnically offensive. But I would argue, I think you could make a case that Hollywood is a Zionist town and it's filled with Christian Zionists and secular Zionists. There's a fairly, I, I think a fairly widespread consensus among people who wield power in the business that that um, that Israel is a special country, a special nation. So I, I, I believe that you're right that um, support for Israel is not only a Jewish phenomenon in Hollywood but it's a very widespread phenomenon and it doesn't matter what people's religions may be or whether they have a religion or not or what ethnic origin they might have. They, um, there, there seems to be a consensus within Hollywood that um, Israel is a state that must be respected and must be defended by all of us in this town. Just to even make the point even more strongly, uh, the vast majority of Hollywood uh, have no power at all. The vast majority of working actors and technicians and all the others 
especially actors. I mean, what is it like? What is it? Four or five percent of actors actually make a living acting. So uh, something uh, like the, that. The, the, yeah. So yeah. I, I, I would guess the, the vast majority of actors uh, do not share uh, this kind of vision uh, that is really a vision of the corporate Democratic Party uh, that goes right back into, you know, Democratic uh, Party foreign policy, which not only sees America as the great bringer of democracy to the world, but they see Israel as the defender of democracy in the Middle East. Right. And... They, and I think there's a thing I say about the United States, but I think these people apply this to Israel, which is they say they think and this is me saying this, but the United States does bad things, but they do it for good reasons. And I think they apply that to Israel. Oh, yes, they do horrible stuff, but they do it for good reasons. Um, and it's part of this same vision of, of, of the role of America. And, and of course, the this establishment in Hollywood is one of the main funders of the corporate democratic party. So you, you can't, even, you can't really separate the two, but knowing all that, knowing you know, not only are you going to be potentially subject to some economic consequences here, and I'm sure you already got this, but now you're going to get it more. Now, of course, you're, uh, you're a self-hating Jew and you're promoting, you're helping the anti-Semitism. Uh, so do, how much of that do you get? Well, I, so far, I have not been called a self-hating Jew because I'm not a Jew. Oh, I thought you were. I read somewhere you were. Okay. <laughs> well, well, Ed Asner, sure. <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll I'll clarify that later. Um, All right. So, uh, so the accusation against me would not be self-hating Jew. It would be straightforward anti-Semitism, or. Right. The, I, I prefer the more straightforward term Jew hatred or Jew hater. Um, so, yes, that is that is uh, an accusation that uh, we have to contend with. And by the way, I also agree with you that ninety nine and a half percent of the actors and other cultural workers in Hollywood are peons. We are working class, working stiffs, and uh, we have to keep our opinions pretty much to ourselves because it's not a town that tolerates controversy. So that's- So why did you stick your neck out? I guess it has to do with a sense of urgency about the injustice that I see in the world and a kind of nagging conscience that tells me you have to do something about this. You, you can't just sit in silence. You can't just go about your life. You have, you, you have to recognize this and you have to call it what it is, and then you have to do something about it. Do whatever you can in your little corner of the world, which is all I have. Uh, I, I have an occupation and I have a family and I live in California, but I, so I, I, I have no real power. Um, but I think we can all do something to combat injustice when we see it. And uh, so I think it's, it's that, that combination of, a, of uh, a perception of injustice, which as an actor, I have time to look into because I don't work very much. So I have time to study and inform myself and converse with other people. And in the course of that, if you have time, you you see the in injustice and, of course, the catastrophe that's impending for all of us in climate change. But you see injustice, and if if you feel if if you have some sense about injustice, you it feels like air pollution. You may not it the injustice may not be taking place on your block, but it's poisoning 
the air that you and your family, your children are breathing. So there's a sense of injustice. And then there's a, a sense of uh, conscience, I think, that I, I don't know whether that comes from my Catholic upbringing. We, we were uh, gro groomed or we were taught to be very sensitive to the question of right and wrong in our, in our lives. And, you know, the, the, there were lengthy interpretations of the Ten Commandments. Um, and uh, we had uh, catechism classes. And so I, I, uh, I, I grew up with a kind of um, inbuilt um, conscience uh, that I probably couldn't shut up if I wanted it to. When we talked on the phone before the interview a couple of days ago, um, you know, you made it clear that, first of all, because of your support for BDS, you, you don't think there should be these uh, co-productions with an Israeli production company. But you also had issues with the content of these kinds of shows. Uh, what, what was that about? Fauda was uh, the forerunner of Hit and Run. Fauda was, uh, I believe, 100% Israeli produced. Uh, I believe the dialogue was all in Arabic or Hebrew. So that was a homegrown Israeli production, which Netflix decided to buy and to stream. So it appears, and we, we don't have any hard data, but it appears that, that Fauda was a popular success, and I believe it was a critical success as, as well, um, which brings up the subject of television critics and film critics who seem to be politically clueless. But what was your issue with Fauda? What, what didn't you like about Fauda? Fauda takes place in Israel, Israel, proper within the Green Line and in uh, the occupied territories. And it asks the audience to follow and to sympathize with a group of military special forces infiltrators who enter Palestinian society pretending to be Palestinian so that they can undermine the resistance within Palestine. And of course, the, the focus is, uh, the, so much American and world international entertainment has to have good guys and bad guys. So the ultimate bad guy is uh, a Palestinian terrorist. And there are levels of guilt, I think you would say, within the Palestinian community that is resisting the occupation. Uh, but the the producers always want you to keep in mind that this is re this is about one evil terrorist, and along the way, we're going to show you Palestinians as almost human beings. I, I'm not articulating this very well, but I, I feel that the the import of Fauda was that the occupation was not an issue. The issue was Palestinian resistance, which had to be combated by darker-skinned Israelis who could plausibly pass as Palestinians so that they could infiltrate Palestinian society, spy on them, and take whatever actions it were necessary. Now, I got 
my opinion is based on viewing the premiere episode of the show. So people may say, what you didn't see episode nine in the second season where they contradict where what you see contradicts what you're what you're saying right now but i think i i I absorbed a lot of information from the premiere episode that's what sets up that's what sets the ball in motion that's that is is designed to engage the audience for the first time and tell you this is what we're about these are the people you're going to be watching and caring about and rooting for so here it is um and uh, but i also read accounts by people who sat through many many more episodes um including a, a, a reviewer uh for jewish currents uh who confirmed the impression that i had that Fauda is basically a racist show, which gets a lot of points for not caricaturing every single Palestinian in the drama. So that, that I, I and it and it 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 glorifies and asks you to sympathize with the Mizrahi who is a very interesting wrinkle. They have to prove themselves to their lighter skinned superiors. And I don't know if you if you saw the show, but I'm I'm curious to know what your response was to that um very intriguing aspect of it. Because Lior Raz, the the star of Fauda and now the star of Hit and Run, is a darker skinned Israeli, possibly of Arabic ancestry, but uh Jewish self-identified Jewish, um, it, it, it raises that interesting angle. And I don't know how many uh, people in the international audience got that. I'm assuming that everyone in the Palestinian audience or the Israeli audience saw that there was a, that there was a, a twist, an intriguing little twist in this episode because these this uh unit of special forces operatives um functions is able to function the way they do because they look a little more like palestinians and um and i think there is there's something even a little bit insidious about that because there uh, i i'm pretty confident that there is some serious racism within the Jewish community in Israel, where darker skin signifies one thing and lighter skin signifies something else. Even amongst Jew- amongst the Jews, I, I, I'm, there's no doubt that like Ethiopian Jews and others of darker complexion, there's right. no question there's a racial pecking order. I mean, I've, okay. I've been to Israel a couple of times. I've seen okay. it. Uh, I, I mean, I, I only saw a little bit of Fauda and then I... Uh, I, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't want to watch anymore. It's pissing me off too much. Uh, and uh, but it's sort of like watching police shows about American cities where uh, the cops, you know, are policing uh, impoverished areas of a major city where there's drugs and crime. And you can have a good cop. You can have a bad cop. Uh, but the underlying assumption is never questioned, uh, which is why is all this crime taking place? And obviously, it's because of chronic poverty, and obviously, it's because of the way uh, these laws uh, encourage uh, uh, police to be brutal in order to defend the wealthy neighborhoods, and the crime isn't supposed to ever spill into the white neighborhoods. Right. So th- these police shows, well, you know, they may show you a bad cop, but they'll never question why the hell is this crime continuing. And and so, so I found, you know, Fauda was similar from what I saw. And, uh, you know, the, the whole question of the occupation is never talked about. And right. uh, certainly the, you know, the underlying problem is never brought to the surface, even if it shows you some complexity in the characters of the Israelis who can have a dark side or the Palestinians, as you say, can be humanized. But it's still within the context 
of not questioning why the hell are they, (laughs) why are Palestinians fighting using these kinds of tactics, which I totally disagree with, but I get why when you're desperate, you do desperate things. Uh, And the occupation that doesn't get critiqued. So, right. um, Well, that's, that's, so I, I, go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to jump to another topic here, if you want to say something first. Well, I, I don't know if this is the topic you want to go to, but um, we, you and I both object strenuously to the content, to the premises, to the assumptions of Fauda. Now, I read portions of the script of Hit and Run, and... I think you said at the beginning of our conversation that uh, in Hit and Run, you don't really get a sense that there are any Palestinians in this place called Israel or this place called Tel Aviv, right? So, now, in what I saw, which was maybe the first two or three episodes. Yeah. Okay, so it's it's almost as if they don't exist. They're neither bad guys nor good guys. They're just invisible. Uh, that was your experience so far. And I am prepared to believe that hit and run is apolitical, that it doesn't really touch on the issue of the Zionist occupation of British Mandate Palestine. It's just an action thriller that happens to take place in Tel Aviv and then move to New York and back and forth. And it's it's just it's it's a it's a generic thriller with some great twists and turns and revelations. And it's you 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 can't attack it as being propaganda for apartheid. I'm willing to believe that. I'm willing to grant that. But the point for me is that there is this collaboration, a creative collaboration between Israeli television companies, producers, writers, and American companies, producers, writers. And that unification even if it's only commercial, has implications because it normalizes the state of Israel. It normalizes Israeli society. It normalizes the Israeli commercial production of goods, including television shows. And I think that it tells us in in the audience, these companies, these commercial enterprises can collaborate and create good entertainment for you. And to accept that without question, I think, is a way of saying, I accept the occupation. I accept the apartheid system. The people who are making this television with my people can't be bad people because they're entertaining me together. And by golly, I can't find anything political about this show. It's just really engaging whodunit and uh, hit and run and punch and take the punch. It's, it's exciting stuff. I, I, I repeat myself, it normalizes apartheid. Well, what do you say to people uh, who say that Countries around the world shouldn't co-produce with the United States then because the United States has committed more crimes around the world than Israel has. There's no doubt that Israel has committed these crimes, but one, they're enabled by the United States. Israel wouldn't be what it is without American support. And then in terms of the amount of wars carried out, I mean, we're witnessing as we speak uh, Another uh, chapter in the destruction of Afghan society is going on. Uh, but you go Iraq, Vietnam, and you go on and on. Um, that, that, that to refuse to co-produce with Israel, then you should extend that to not co-producing with the United States. Well, I think, Paul, that's, uh, that 
objection fits into the larger uh, scheme of the uh, objection that you've raised before uh, that we, BDS, and others who oppose the state of Israel, we're picking on Israel. It's th that I think is actually the language that many people use. Why are you picking on Israel? It's unfair. It's hypocritical to pick on Israel. Why are you doing it? To answer your question, if a Canadian or German film company declared that they were pulling out of a scheduled production because they did not want to be associated with the United States and its racist, imperialist, militaristic policies, I would say, great. I, I don't own a German company and I, I don't own an Irish or Australian or New Zealand company that I, I, which I could decide not to do any, any work with the United States. But I would, I, I would welcome that decision by any country in the world. Can I, as a, as a BDS supporter and activist, can I tell Ireland or France or Germany, stop doing business with us? I, I, I don't have that, that kind of power. I can say that, yes. Why, why pick on Israel, uh, to use your language? Um, well, I, I didn't say, I didn't say, pick, I think you, I didn't say you were quoting someone. No, I, I think you were quoting yeah, someone but, else. Um, yeah, and yeah, I apologize yeah, but, if that's, if I mischaracterized what you said, but, but the spirit of it is you're picking on this little guy and it's really, and it's really unfair. Uh, first of all, the idea that th the most powerful military I believe in all of the Middle East, uh, they're, they're the little guys, um, is not accurate. Um, so it's, so I object to that idea that we're, uh, BDS is this big bully that is picking on little Israel. I think there's something uh, not skewed right there. Um, and so picking on Israel, um, and the other part of your question, and I, I don't want to get it, get it, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the other part of your question is why not target other nations who are equally racist, brutal, anti-democratic, right? I mean, is that not a question that 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 the Zionist uh, apologists ask? Am I? Yeah, I'm, I'm right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that you know that that's a. I'm not, I, I'm I'm not I'm not saying that, but okay. uh, people. But that certainly is a critique of BDS. Now there are critiques of BDS I do agree with, but I don't agree with those ones. I, I think there's good reasons to target. Uh, Israeli apartheid, uh, and uh, but so that wouldn't be my position. I think. Okay. I think there's like if I were an actor, I would take the same position you did, uh, and I would do it for the reasons of that. There's a particular responsibility to force the conversation on the uh, Israeli occupation and the attacks on Gaza, and if you're in a position to be able to force that conversation, I would do it. So. I, 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 my my issues with BDS are a little different. I'm a little more with Chomsky and uh, Norman Finkelstein, who have some critiques of it. But I, I don't personally have any. I mean, I would not work with an Israeli production company. <laughs> let's be let's be clear about that. Go, but go ahead. So uh, you you raise Chomsky and uh, Finkelstein, and 
and lots of other people who are on the fence would cite Chomsky and Finkelstein. Um, and I think Chomsky's position is evolving. Um, Finkelstein is one of the bravest human beings I can think of. Uh, and so I take their, uh, I, and I don't know what, what their specific critiques are, but the, the question, I'm, I'm a simple minded guy. So the question that I always have to answer is if you're not going to participate in BDS and back it and give it your, give it your full support. What are you doing? What are you doing? Show me another action. And if I think that it will ameliorate the injustice and the oppression and the crimes against property and people, if, if I'm convinced that that will work, I'll do it. But if, if you're refusing to engage in BDS because, it's, because you have certain objections to it, the question is, what the fuck else are you doing? Are you asking me the question? Because <laughs> I'll answer it. I'm happy well, no, to answer it. I, I, I'm, I'm asking... Uh, I'm asking I mean, listen, John Chomsky and is, go ahead. Well, Chomsky, Chomsky and Finkelstein, I think, have made a big contribution in in condemning the occupation, condemning the attacks on Gaza. They've done a tremendous amount of educating and raising public opinion about Israeli action. So, I mean, I think they've done a lot, mm -hmm. and I I also think you turning down this part or the audition. And speaking out publicly is a, is a real contribution. So, uh, I mean, I, I, maybe it's uh, to really get into the BDS issues, maybe a whole nother conversation. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I certainly think Israel deserves uh, a boycotting and deserves a disinvestment. And I think the conversation that's been sparked on university campuses and else and generally by BDS has really been a good thing. But I do think that some, at least some of the BDS leadership or some of the people in BDS, and this I'm getting more, you know, from Finkelstein and Chomsky, uh, to, to es essentially go to the, to the point that the objective is there shouldn't be a, any state of Israel at all. And so it should be boycotted uh, and sanctioned and so on because it shouldn't exist uh, and thus there shouldn't be any contact with it. Uh, I, I take Finkelstein's point that whether, you know, if you were back at the UN vote in the founding of the state of Israel, one may be, be able to argue that, but, but there actually is a legal state now called Israel. That doesn't mean it needs to be a racist theocratic state. That doesn't mean it has to be a Jewish state. In fact, you know, any state to me that's based on a religion or an ethnicity is a racist state, and and Israel's not the only one. I mean, Iran's another one. Uh, you know, Iran's a theocracy. Saudi Arabia is a theocracy, and Israel is essentially they call themselves democratic, but you can't be democratic and be a theocracy at the same time, in my mind. So at the same time, it's, it is a state. It's a legal state. Uh, Chomsky, if I'm understanding his critique, he thinks this demand of right of return. Now, I don't know if he's changed his mind on this. I was just reading something of his from a few years ago, that the right of return is a legitimate demand, but it's not one that's going to happen anywhere within the realm of this state of Israel, the current state of Israel. If you, I mean, if you had a right of return, you'd have, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, you know, back, moving back into Israel. and With and, keys. And, with keys to their keys. homes in their hands. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So well, I, uh, if you're trying, uh, Chomsky's point here is I don't think that that would be wrong from any moral point of view. It's just what is the practical political effect of that demand? And I, I think it's important that as, as much as Israel uh, has become thoroughly racist in it as a society. And last time I was there, I just went in it for a It was always hours, racist, was wasn't it? It was and, always the racist. Conce- well, I, I think the concept of a Jewish state from day one is a racist concept, yes. But amongst the public opinion, uh, I was there in the uh, mid, as a kid in the mid teenager in 1967, just before the war, and my sister was there. And then I went again uh, just a few years ago. I was actually in, I, w- I was on my way to Ramallah. I spent most of my time in the occupied territories, but I was in Israel for a few days. The, the, the level of racism, overt racism, just talking to people on the streets was very different than in the mid 60s when I was there. It, it was off, I, I, can't, I, I can't describe it. I, I, like, I don't, I don't know even in the Jim Crow South of the United States, the, uh, the ease with which people talked about Palestinians as if they were animals. Um, and, and I interviewed this uh, young Palestinian girl in, uh, she was in, uh, I guess that was in Beirut in a refugee camp. And I, I, I was interviewing her on camera and she, uh, I said, what, what would be your message to the Israeli Jewish kids. And she looked, she had this young 13, 14 year old girl. She'd been smiling, talking about her life or on problems, you know, normal way. She looked at me very sternly and she said, I wish you were dead. I said, that's what you would say to them. And I said, why? And she said, cause I saw on television, they were preparing bombs to drop on Gaza and they had a group of Jewish children and they took chalk and they were writing their names on the bombs. It was on Israeli television. And I confirmed this later. This actually was on Israeli television and she saw it. I mean, that level, I mean, that's, that's depraved. And then, you got, and then you wonder why young Palestinian kids get so desperate. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable, really, that there's been practically no terrorism for years. And that's because the Palestinians themselves decided it was a negative tactic. Uh, but the uh, extent of racism is, 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 so, is so profound in Israel now. Uh, yeah. I've a, I've a little bit lost track of what I was saying. But the... Uh, so, so I, in terms of BDS, though, oh, this is what I was heading at. I think it's very important for the Palestinians and for everyone who is in solidarity with Palestinians in any sense of justice, not to help the process of fascization and racism in Israel. What I mean by that is... the. There are, at least there were, there's less now elements within Israeli society, but there's still some who, who don't agree with the, the uh, bombing of Gaza, who, who don't agree with the occupation, who do either want a two-state solution, and there's Jewish Israelis who, who are for a one-person, one-vote, single state, which to me makes the most sense. Uh, with the right but, of but return. To, well, that's where the question comes. Do you push the right of return? Because if it's not a really winnable demand, does it actually unify Israeli public opinion against any kind of uh, concession and compromise? Like political demands, it's not just moral question in my mind. It also has to be, can you win the thing? And that's a, and that's a political calculation And Chomsky is predicting, in effect, that the assertion, the implementation of the right of return will have overwhelming negative consequences. And Noam is 
one of my heroes. He's a truth teller. But when he ventures into prediction of what will happen if he's no more qualified than you or I to make those predictions and to say, let's not do something because it might have negative consequences for the people we care about. Now, I, I just want to say that I, uh, I, one of your programs that I really, really admired uh, was when you had, for, I, for the third time, I didn't see it the first time, Sheer Hever from yeah. Germany. Yeah. Um, and uh, he said such... Uh, wonderful, intelligent things like we, uh, the BDS movement isn't my movement. It's not an American movement. It's not a British or German movement. It, we don't own it. We follow. And I, I'm a follower. And I'm pretty simple-minded. And if I see that the Palestinian people are asking us to isolate Israel economically, culturally, intellectually, academically, I take that very seriously. And your guest, Sheer Hever, said... I believe I'm, I think I'm quoting him. We shouldn't be talking about one or two state solutions or Hamas versus Fatah. That's none of our business. And he, he lays out the three conditions which were put together by the Palestinian originators of the movement. One, end the occupation. Two, equal rights for all citizens. Three, respect the right of return. So those are the three demands, and I thank you for educating me by presenting Sheer on your show. Those, uh, those are the conditions under which the, those are the endpoints at which the Palestinian leadership of the BDS movement would call an end to boycott, divestment, and sanctions. So do, number one, do we agree with those goals? Do we agree with the Palestinians, the Palestinian people who are making those demands? Um, and how can we how can we help them to isolate israel in my case culturally because i'm I, I i'm not an economist i'm not i, I i'm not a businessman i'm I, I work in show business and how can i support the bds movement um so uh and and i say that respectfully uh, about Noam Chomsky and respectfully about Finkelstein. Um, I, I, I think they're both great minds and great truth tellers, but they're not infallible political strategists. And I, I wonder if they're listening as closely as they should be to the, the leadership in, in the Palestinian civil society. Well, I was going to get to Ken Burns' Vietnam show. I'm going to let you have the last word on BDS. Um, but I don't think we have time to do that now. So we'll have another conversation about your life and your activism. Um, but I thank you for joining me. And... Uh, and I certainly just uh, put a final note on the BDS thing. 
the final decision whether BDS is up to the Palestinians, no doubt. Uh, they've called for it, or certainly many of the Palestinian activists have called for it. And I, I think probably, I don't think there's much doubt the majority of Palestinians support it. Um, and in the final analysis, they're the ones that are going to have to decide their tactics. Well, I want to thank you for having me on. Thank you for interviewing Gabriel Byrne, Beth uh, 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 Sheer Hevel, and uh, Matt Taibbi. I, I think that you have made a real contribution. And I, uh, I don't know whether you've promised to bring me back or if you've said something like it would be nice to have me back. But No, no, no. I want to do it. No, I definitely want to go through. Okay, because I want to talk yeah, there's a lot more me, to say about the impact of culture on the way people think. And the, uh, the best, I'll, I'll end with this. The best propaganda is good entertainment. All right. Thanks very much for joining me, Dave. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. Please don't forget the donate button because uh, we can't do this without you, the subscribe button uh, if you're watching on YouTube. And for now, it looks like we're going to be sticking around on YouTube for a while. Uh, but come visit us on our website where you can sign up for the email list at theanalysis.news.